Q&A time here at the House of Power. Welcome back to the Power Up Public YouTube channel. We put a call out last week to all our fans on Instagram, Facebook and YouTube for questions that they want answered and today's the day. So let's get to it. Alright, so one of the first questions was, and there was actually two different people that asked a similar question is, what exercises do we recommend to stay fit for go-kart? Okay, so first off, a little disclaimer, I'm not a personal trainer and I don't proclaim to be, but I do train a lot and I see a lot of exercise. So I will give you my advice of what I would do to stay fit and healthy for go-karting. Now, core strength being a key component. Now, the core is the muscles here that support your spine and you need a strong spine so you don't get any injuries. And also, you want to be able to pull your shoulders back when you drive a go-kart and it stops the compression load on your ribs. So these, the, these muscles are very important for go-karting so you can hold yourself perfectly still in your seat with your shoulders back and your head upright and you don't want to fatigue and start to slouch towards the end of the race because then you can hit the curbs, start to sort of damage that cartilage between your rib cage, and that's something you want to try to avoid. So core strength is key, you can do V-sits, you can do plank, you can hold those for three to five minutes if you're the boss at it, it's something you could build up like over time. So you can do your side plank, your front plank, your other side plank, you can do your V-sits, you can do like a core blast, at any ab work, any core strength, yoga, pilates, they're both very good for that sort of area of your body. Um, and then we get into our endurance. Now, for karting, it's hot, it's sweaty, it's hard work. It goes for a long time. You have to stay in the zone and concentrate without going, oh, geez, my body's hurting. So for that, I recommend mountain biking or cycling on the road. Obviously, wear all your safety gear because it can be dangerous. You don't want to get injured and get you out of the car. You're trying to get better, faster, fitter, stronger not weaker, injured, and more sooky. So get a mountain bike, go hit the tracks. The longer you can keep your heart rate up, the better. The good thing with mountain biking is you cycle up and do all the hard work, you turn around, and then you can get the fun part at the end where you're hooning down the, the mountain bike tracks, and it's super fun. Makes you, your reactions focus, obviously, because you have to be switched on. We're trying to avoid all the rocks and the trees. And it's sort of high intensity interval training. So that's a good one for go-karting as well. And then for your sort of long distance endurance, you get on the road bike, you cycle for an hour and a half up a mountain or up the road, turn around and ride the hour and a half home. Your heart's working the whole time. Your legs are pumping, they're big muscles and your endurance is building. So endurance, mountain biking and cycling and core strength, yoga, pilates, and your sort of, uh, all your ab sort of exercises, plank, v-sits, core exercises. Also, I personally like the competition slash group atmosphere of F45 and CrossFit. I find them for myself to be the best to stay motivated and not slack off during workouts. Um, if you're interested in those things, go to your local gym and try them out. I find them to be excellent as well. Another thing to stay focused on your exercise regime is what you eat. Obviously, you don't put the dirtiest, crappiest petrol in your go-kart. You put the best premium pump fuel you can buy and the same for your body. You want to try to eat the best sort of foods on race day to stay focused and attentive and fatigue resistant. So we're talking chicken and pastas, we're talking egg and lettuce sandwiches, if you like those sorts of things, fruit, bananas, apples, you can use almond butter, if you can't digest almonds easily, that's what I use. Um, dates have got a lot of sugar in them, which is great for that light snack in between a race. So start to investigate what you eat on race day and write down what you ate that day and keep a journal of what it was that was excellent if you have an excellent result and just eat the exact same thing. Maybe substitute in one extra whatever, beef, chicken, pasta, rice, whatever it is, substitute in one little thing and write it down. And if you have a, like a great day and you get to the end of the day and you feel excellent, well, next time, get the exact same ingredients, portion it out before you get there in four 
if you've got four races, four small meals, so that you're not overeating. You want to sort of control everything on a race weekend so that you can really focus on taking race victories. So four small meals, doctor what they are, write down what it is that you're going to eat, and then just sort of change it as necessary to improve your performance. So the next question is in regards to the latest iteration of the X30 iArmy engine versus the latest Rotax Evo engine at our local track. So at our local track, we just had a big race meeting here. It was the AKC, which is our Australian Kart Championship. And in the um, TAG 125 class, it's a pro weight class. So it's halfway between your, what your light and your heavy class weights would be. And the kart that won that was, he, I mean, obviously he's a great driver, but he was driving a PRD Galaxy 125. Now those carts can run a bit lighter because of the local weight here in Australia. But then the next, say, 10 or 12 carts were all Rotax engines, and then a mixture of Rotax and iArmy X30. So in the heavier categories, if you're a heavier driver, I would suggest you want to get a Rotax Evo engine. And if you're a lighter driver in a lighter category, I think you can still get away with the X30 engine. They are great engines. They're very, very close, very similar in performance. If anything, at the moment, for the exact same weight in a heavier category, I'd say the Rotax has got the edge. It's pretty hard to measure because I haven't been to the circuit and gone Rotax engine, switch, X30 engine, and go again. So I can't tell you firsthand the difference for me, but from what I can see, if you're a heavier driver, I would lean towards the Rotax E. If you're liking these videos, please consider subscribing, turning on your notifications, and just generally being awesome. Hit the like button as well while you're at it. So the next question is, if you could give one piece of advice to a go-karter, what would it be? Okay, so some of the guys at my local club coined a term and it is pronounced TITS, which stands for time in the seat. So it sounds a little funny, but what it really comes down to is K's. K's is king. The more time you can spend in the seat practicing and practicing the right things, the better you'll become and the faster you'll be able to become that. So we talk very much about mastery and mastering certain skills in life and that is basically 10,000 hours of practice. So the sooner you can do that, the sooner you can master one particular skill. Now, if you look at golf or tennis or surfing, snowboarding, motorbike riding, generally there's a little bit of inherent natural talent, but then right behind that is a whole bunch of practice. And the most talented people will get to a point and then they'll rely on their talent to get them through. And you'll often find it's the guy with maybe not quite the perfect natural born talent for a sport that just grinds and grinds and grinds and grinds and works harder and harder and harder than everybody else that becomes the best. So if you want to become the best as a go-kart driver, yes, you can ride mountain bikes. Yes, you can go to yoga and do CrossFit and be the fittest guy in the world. That's a part of it. Yes, you can eat the perfect diet, but until you get your butt in the seat and go and bust out laps, laps and laps and laps, day after day after day, weekend after weekend, winning races, building confidence, getting the Ks in, grinding hard on the project, that's where you'll get the success. So time in the seat, that is critical. The next question is how to rebuild a Rotax Max clutch. So we have covered this be subject before in a video and you can check out the link here or in the description below, we'll, we'll uh, add the link there. Now, Rotax Max clutches, we don't really rebuild them as much as we service the bearing and checking on the clutch shoes. You can replace the clutch shoes before they break. Most guys just keep using the engine and then wait for the telltale signs of a broken clutch with um, like a, the engine will stall as you come into the pits or it'll make a real tinging sound and that's normally one of the shoes is broken off the, the clutch shoe pack and you can just unbolt those, bolt on a new set and go again. So it's a simple procedure. Check out that video and we will make another one with some more in-depth Rotax Max clutches in the coming months. Okay, so the next question is a great one and it is what is the key to the power at the House of Power being Power Republic? Okay, it comes from a great customer of ours. It's a little bit of a loaded question, but I just touched on it. 
the key to any mastery of any one skill is uh, 10,000 hours a minimum. I've been here for 10 years as a mechanic. I work around 60 to 70 hours per week. You bust that down over a 50 week year, I'm kind of pushing some of the limits of 10,000 hours, but it's over the whole spectrum of the business of go-karting, engine preparation, you know, changing carts, changing drivers, changing minds, working with dads, working with kids. It's all encompassing. So for me, I don't sort of class myself as a master. I have plenty of success over the years and I'm still working to get better, just like you guys at home. And I'm just grinding on the projects. So I'm just working every day, getting better, faster, fitter, stronger, smarter. And the only way to do that is to read books, work on my health and fitness, and incrementally improve on every aspect of my life. And that's what is the key, really, to the secrets here at the House of Power. There's no one thing, it's just hard work and lots of it. So the next question is how to remove the reinforcement from your axles. So this question I believe is about when we slide the axle stiffeners inside of the axle. Now the easiest way to get those out is to get a 30 millimeter or a 40 millimeter axle and slide it inside your 50 millimeter axle and then just hit the axle stiffeners all the way through out to the other end and knock them out. That's the easiest way to knock those out. I hope that answers that question the correct way, if you have answered, asked that question and it is the wrong interpretation, please let me know in the comment section below. So the next question is, how many hours do you get between engine rebuilds? So this question really sort of stems from most new customers that haven't been involved racing for very long. So I will say most air-cooled engines you can leave for around sort of 10 to 15 hours of use before you'll start to notice some sort of performance decline. Engines don't normally blow up and fly apart, generally speaking, because you use them for too long in the top end department. The bottom end is different. If the Conrad bearing goes through too many cycles, it has a tendency to fail. The thrust washers fly out through the engine and destroy everything. It's not great. But saying that too, it's budget related. So if you buy a secondhand engine, feel free to use it for as long as you like. Sometimes it can last, but it's a bit of a lottery. When we're talking brand new engines, I think for an air-cooled engine, IAMI KA100 here in Australia, or the Vortex Mini Rock engine are two that come to mind. So those two engines, you can easily run them for 10 to 15 hours. The performance drop-off may be there towards the end of that 15 hours. However, if you're racing at AKC or your national level or your big state title races, get your engine rebuilt before you go. Tick it off the list, it's done, it's not going to fail, it's been inspected, it's got a new piston and a ring, it's going to perform at its best, and you're going to have it at the most important meeting. And then, from there, you can use it at your club meetings afterwards, and the not-so-critical races. As you get closer to the front, and you want to win all the time, those hours will drop down to whatever you feel is the most important to you. So if the race is coming up and you really want to win it, same thing, you're going to employ your state title, or national title level racing protocol and you're probably going to get your engine rebuilt before you go. Or at least have one of your two or three engines that you have available in its freshest condition so you can put that on as a go-to and you've got a good backup and then if it all goes wrong, maybe you have enough resources so you have three engines um, and that's probably the best way to go there. The Rotax engines, they're water-cooled and it's a different style piston and ring setup over the, the IAMI and the Vortex, so they last longer. You can easily go 20 hours on a piston there. We've raced at the top level and still qualified on the front row with an engine of 17 hours. The Rotax product does have the best longevity, in my opinion, for performance versus engine rebuilding frequency, if you want. Now, the one thing about most racing two-strokes, especially the 125s, is the, the big end Conrad bearing fails. So you want to get those changed at the 40 to 50 hour mark. Don't push it if your engine is getting inspected and the thrust washers are blue. It's time to start considering re replacing your Conrod, big end, crank pin and thrust washers. So the next question comes from a good friend of mine, Kev Davies. He's a shout out to Uncle Kev. He's a crazy guy here on the, in, in southeast Queensland. He's the commentator. Um, 
Kev Davy Sports Photography is a shout out to him on Facebook. You can go over and check him out. Now, Kev's question was, how would you suggest a driver transitions from K Cadet 12 to KA4 Junior, and what essential steps do you need to undertake? So, if you're going to transition from the 12s to the Junior category, what I'd suggest is going to your, and, and you're not, we're just talking about normal club day race. We're not talking about the national guys, because they transition quite easily, because they've already raced the toughest kids in that category in the country, and they're going to go up, but they're probably going to be racing similar kids because they all sort of seem to step up as the years go along anyway. Now, if you're going from the 12s to the juniors and you're not at that top level, what I would suggest is going to your local clubs that aren't quite as big and racing as much as you can before you make the step so you can try to build a little bit of confidence in yourself as a driver. So that when you make the step, you're not intimidated by those older kids on the grid looking at you going, oh, who's this guy? Because I remember back when I was a kid and I stepped up through the ranks, I was always, oh, wow, well, there's that older driver. And I had my drivers that I used to look up to. And the older drivers, they had the experience, they, and I'd been watching them for years. So that when I naturally went up to race against them, I was a little bit intimidated. But as it it turns out they were just drivers the same as you and me and that's all they are they just practice more so if you practice just as much and you practice the right things and the fundamentals and you've got those down pat then there's no reason you can't race with them they're just people they have skills they have weaknesses they have strengths you want to sort of try to pick their weaknesses or their slowest part on the track and use that as hopefully your strength and that's where you attack them and then obviously they're going to be better than you and you want to defend in a different area of the track where they have their strengths so it might be at the end of the back straight or coming into a hairpin so it's just another driver it's just another race it's just another race meeting it's just another lap you know delete everything it's just all about that next lap and you want to focus very much on the very next corner and delete everything else and it's just a driver, it's just a go-kart, and you want to go out there. And the real race starts when you get to the front and you're just trying to beat yourself. That's where the challenge starts. So beat yourself and everything else will take care of it itself. So that's my advice to you. Okay, so the next question is, what is the difference between all the rim types? Now, we have covered different Tony Kart rim types in a video. You can check the link here or in the description below. Now, what I would suggest is you need to get two different types of rims and go to your local track and back-to-back -back test those over different days, different conditions, different weather types, summer, winter, temperature, dirty, clean, fast. You need to just get an understanding of when you need type A and when you need type B. When you can highlight those better because through practice with your local conditions and your car, your driving style, you can start to employ them on a needs to base. So get a good understanding of your equipment through practice and writing down quality notes of when to use certain rims on certain days. And then that's what I would recommend. And once you've got a good understanding of two different types, say MXL magnesium wheels versus your standard magnesiums or your aluminiums, you've, once you've got a good understanding between two different sets, then you could add a third set because you've got the skills to sort of diagnose when to use a certain type of room. Hope that helps. So the next question is, what are some excuses for not winning? Now, this question comes from a funny guy at our local club and I'm pretty sure he's just having a joke, but you've re definitely got to blame the engine guy, the mechanic, your dad, someone else that's touched the car, the cart trolley, the temperature of the day, uh, you're jetting, the fuel from the service station, the batch of tyres is not right, um, my cart's old, uh, I didn't get a good batch of tyres, oh, we covered that one, but that's pretty common. So there's, there's tons of excuses you can use, but the number one thing is if the less finger pointing you do to other people and the more you do to yourself, you can improve. Every time you acknowledge that you've made a mistake, you can improve on that mistake and get it out of your game. So excuses are good for jokes, but if you really want to improve, try not to blame everybody else in the whole paddock. 
blame yourself, take ownership of your problems, and your problems will disappear. Okay, so the next question is from my good friend Brock Thornton up in Toowoomba, and his question is, which way do I move my clip on the needle for better acceleration of my on my Rotax engine? Okay, so we do have a video on tuning your Rotax carburetor here. We will link it in the description below. But when it comes to tuning your Rotax engine on the clip or the needle, you move the clip position down on the needle to get a richer condition, and you move the clip up on the needle to get a leaner condition. Now, the times I would change those is if I put my foot down off on a corner and it feels like it's sort of hollow, like there's no nothing there, I've got to wait for the engine to speed up. Generally, if you're talking tuning, it is too lean off the corner. So we're going to move our clip position down to give us a richer needle position. Now, when we have gone too far and the carburetor is too rich off the corners, as you put your foot down on the accelerator, it, the engine will splutter, it'll make a blah, 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 blah noise, and you need to really floor the accelerator to get it to go. Okay, that's a classic condition of you have, your engine is way too rich, and you need to lean your needle off. So you want to bring that needle clip position up, which brings your needle down. So that's how I tune my Rotax needle position, and it's the same for my Vortex Mini Rocks or any slide carburetor that has a you know, uh, an adjustment on the needle with a, a different clip position. The next question is, how do you know when it's time to update your rolling chassis? Okay, so some of the things to look for on a chassis, now we did have a video, and you can check it up here and in the description below, is our beginner's guide to karting, where we talk about all the things that can wear out on a go-kart. We're talking the chassis tubes wear out because they grind on the onto the track when they flex through the the waist of the cart, axles bend, bearings wear out, tie rods wear, brake lines and brakes all wear. So everything's wearing as you use it. So when you get a brand new cart, obviously all that is new and excellent. And then you've got varying degrees of use and varying degrees of sort of disrepair. So it really comes down to your budget. If you've got tons of budget available, buy a new cart once a year. In January, race it for the whole se season, and then at the end of the year, move it on and get yourself another car new for the next season. So however often you want to update your chassis, all comes down to your budget. The main things to look for, cracks in your chassis, wear on the tubes, wear in the bearings, brakes that don't work as good as they were when they're new. They're the main things that wear out, and then the rest are cosmetic changes. Okay, so the last question for this week comes from our friend Craig. And he has been asking a question in regards to the Tony Kart seating position because all the information he's getting is saying that the seats are set flush with the chassis rails, whereas he's used to setting his seats up 16 to 20 millimeters off the ground. So what I suggest is we don't set our seats below the chassis rails only because everyone's jumping curbs and the cart's flexing. So you knock the bottom of the seat out of it pretty quickly. You know, the first wheel you drop off the track, you're going to knock your seat out. So if you're confident you are an awesome driver and you don't drive off the track ever, feel free to drop your seat below the chassis rails if that in improves your performance. If it doesn't, just from a longevity point of view, you know the seat's a pretty integral part of the car and you want to protect it if you can. So set it up flush with the chassis rails. It'll st stop you from bottoming out the seat and wrecking it halfway through a meeting and then you've got to try to change a seat and fit up a new one or sit on a number plate. None of these things are ideal. So look after your seat, set it up flush with your Tony Kart chassis rails and focus on another area for your increased performance. Okay, so there you have it. The Q&As are done for this week. Thanks to everybody that sent in a question over the interwebs over the last week. We're sorry if we didn't get to everyone's questions, but we will endeavor to answer your question next time if we've missed anything. Once again, hit the subscribe button. It's really important to us to keep these videos coming to you. Turn on those notifications, hit the like button, follow us on Instagram and Facebook at Power Republic. Or go to our website, www.powerrepublic.com.au and grab yourself a t-shirt, for a brand new Rotax engine. Thanks for watching. See you in the next video.